Welcome to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the film series with lively discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach cinema studies at the College of Staten Island of the City University of New York. Today we continue our 10-part series, a survey of the new Latin American cinema of the past 25 years. Today we have the privilege of screening Jorge Sanjines's The Courage of the People, a rather remarkable strike film a recreation of an actual massacre that occurred in Bolivia in 1967. If you know the film by Guilo Pontecorvo, The Battle of Algiers, then I think you're a little bit prepared for what this film will be like. You may not be able to tell that in some ways it's not the actual events themselves. We'll be talking about the unusual narrative structure and in fact pr production technique itself of this film afterwards with today's two guests. We have the privilege of having Professor Barbara Morris of Fordham University, and Susan Ryan, a well-known critic and historian of the Latin American cinema. Enjoy the courage of the people. Welcome back to Cinema Then, Cinema Now. I hope you enjoyed the very interesting and very moving courage of the people. Quite an unusual uh, treatment of a strike. We'll be talking about how this film is put together, both in its narrative and also how the film was put together in, it, in its production in a few moments. But uh, let me take this moment to introduce today's two guests to you. Uh, to my left is uh, Professor Barbara Morris. Uh, Barbara teaches in the Department of Modern Languages of Fordham University here uh, in New York. She's a, a scholar of the Latin American and Hispanic cinemas. Recently, she's, been, uh, she's written about the uh, work of the Argentine woman director, Maria Luisa Bemberg, and she's working on the Argentine, uh, Argentine cinema. In addition, her, one of her current projects is a book on representation of women in the Hispanic cinema. Uh, to my right is Susan Ryan. Uh, Susan teaches Latin American cinema in the New York City area. She's taught at NYU and at Montclair uh, State. She's also a uh, scholar with a specialty uh, in Mexican cinema, has written on Salvadoran cinema, has a, uh, an article, at least I'm looking forward to reading, on Orson Welles' involvement with Brazil in the making of his documentary that will be out in the CUNY Film Faculty Quarterly, mm -hmm. uh, Persistence of Vision, available at your newsstand, let's hope, sometime. <laughs> um, in <laughs> addition, really for a number of years, Susan's been working on a selected filmography of the Latin American cinema, <laughs> something that someone like me producing a series like this, <laughs> wish you had finished several years <laughs> ago. But no, it, it will, it will, I'm, I'm sure it'll be exactly the kind of thing that mm -hmm. not only I'll want to see as soon as it's finished, mm -hmm. but let's hope that our viewers who have developed an interest in Latin American cinema already have one, mm -hmm. uh, will find interesting as well. Um, I said you were a specialist in the Mexican cinema, mm -hmm. but in addition to that, uh, Susan, Susan, you've done a lot of work on the context of Bolivian filmmaking right. and on San Gines, mm -hmm. Jorge San Gines, who made this right. film specifically. Could you tell us a little about <coughs> a bit about him, who he is, mm -hmm. and also about the conditions of filmmaking in, in Bolivia. Right. I think very few people know anything about filmmaking in Bolivia because there's so few opportunities to see uh, the films other than films like Courage of the People or some of his other earlier work. But there, there actually was a, a tradition of filmmaking uh, sporadically from the, from the 20s <coughs> onward. But San Ginés began working in film uh, in the 60s. He'd studied philosophy and filmmaking not only in La Paz but had gone to Chile to study okay. filmmaking uh, and had come 
come back uh, in the early 60s and began producing short films actually for the government uh, at that time. His first film that began, uh, that got any recognition at all was a short 10-minute piece called uh, Revolution, uh, which was shown internationally at festivals and was a real uh, tribute to the 1952 revolution okay. in, in Bolivia. But perhaps the film that he was best known for, uh, there was a film in 1965 called Ukamao, uh, which was uh, shot clandestinely uh, because of the repressive government at the time and was also censored by the government when it, when it came out. And because of the conditions that went into making that film, they decided to make the film, uh, name the film collective that he worked with. Uh, also other filmmakers like Antonio Aguino, Ricardo Rada, other filmmakers in Bolivia, they decided to name their collective Ukamao. Let me intervene just for, just for a second mm -hmm. because you've, you've used a word which is, which is uh, I think everybody understands, mm -hmm. but it's a, a word not commonly used mm -hmm. when we think of, of filmmaking communities in the United States or whatever, and mm -hmm. that's a, a, a collective. What mm -hmm. are the essential differences mm -hmm. as you see them between a collective that dedicates itself to filmmaking mm -hmm. and, and a company? I, I should yeah. also add that I w uh, was chatting with some filmmakers mm -hmm. in Europe recently. We recently met, and I said, well, you're a company, and mm -hmm. they immediately corrected me and said, we're not a company, mm -hmm. we're a collective. Right. And I think we associate these films with San Ginés, but very, uh, it was very much a, a collaborative effort, not only among the cameraman, the writer, Oscar Soria, but among the people themselves. I mean, they very much approach filmmaking as a collaborative process, that they work together with the subjects. It's not the filmmakers coming in to uh, make a film about, but making a film working with the people. And I think that's where the Ukamao Collective really stands apart, actually, from many other uh, filmmakers in, in, in Latin America. Now, so are they responsible for his uh, two, uh, the two films of his that are best known here, mm -hmm. which is Blood of the Condor, right. which certainly must be one of the half dozen best known of Latin American films, right. and had a significant life here about 15 years ago theatri right. theatrically. So it's Blood of the Condor and the film we've just seen, Courage right. of the People. Right. Were they both made through the collective? Both were made through the collective, right. And so what's happened? I mean, you know, so, so, well after well after Courage of the People, uh, which uh, was actually produced or uh, the financing was from Italian television, and the post production for the film was done in Italy. Uh, but right at the at the end of the filming, there was another coup, uh, and uh, San Ginés was forced to leave the country, uh, and has not been able to work back there uh, basically since. Okay. Uh, and at the time, members of the several members of the collective decided to stay uh, in Bolivia, Antonio. Antonio Aguino was one and made films there, but of a different nature. Critical, but not in the same political or revolutionary right. context of somebody like San Ginés. And San Ginés went to work in Ecuador, in Peru, uh, and uh, in other places in Latin America, making films also about the problems uh, of the Indians and the exploitation of the Indian culture. Right, 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 right. Well, this film has uh, not only Indians in it, but one of the things that's very interesting about the film to me is that the collectivity of the film mm -hmm. is defined in many ways as a collectivity of women. I mean, right. certainly of workers right. and, uh, and of peasants and right. of women. What do you, I mean, you've <laughs> done a lot of work on women in Latin American film. Right. Mm -hmm. How does that fit in both in this film and in other contexts, uh, Well, from the very first scene, actually, from the, from the, the first strike uh, at, in the beginning sequence of the film, when the first massacre occurs, the camera shows the the people en masse, but the first people that the camera zeroes in on are the women, and they're right. saying, we don't want to starve. So from the very beginning, we know that the women are going to be important in this film. Mm -hmm. Of course, the probably for me, one of the best scenes in the film, and certainly the funniest, if we can talk about humor, any humor in this right. film, certainly mm -hmm. the most ironic, if not humorously ironic, is the scene when the assistant manager comes right. during the hunger strike. Mm -hmm. Right. And the women foreground their their role as women as being passive women mm -hmm. by not responding yes, to his yes. buenos dias and again right. buenos dias and mm -hmm. they don't respond. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yet at the same time, their roles are very modern. They're not just passive women. They're using their passivity as an act of aggression against mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. um, and this silence is something that he can't deal with. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he does uh, is say, where's the leader here? Mm -hmm. And of course, there is no leader. Right. Domitila is, in some ways, of course, their spokesperson, but not their leader. Mm -hmm. Domitila Chungara, who is uh, one of the individualized portraits in right. the film. Right. Um, 
And their final response to him, of course, is using the very stones of the mountains they live on and the tin cans filled with stones to mm -hmm. shut him up and get him out of there. Right. So the women are important as a, also as a force of resistance within the mm -hmm. film. They don't use arms. They use mm -hmm. the only arms they have, mm -hmm. which is their, their passivity in this case. One of the things that's, that's, that's um, very interesting about that scene to me is that there's a double trajectory. There is, that is from their use of passivity, mm -hmm. traditionally conceived of as mm -hmm. their mm -hmm. passive, their women, mm -hmm. as a force of resistance right. mm -hmm. through their activity, the, the, the vocalization mm -hmm. of things, the fact that they are at least as articulate as he is and he's mm -hmm. saying exactly mm -hmm. what it is their complaints are and he mm -hmm. doesn't expect, expect that. Mm -hmm. But the, the reason I say double trajectory is because, of course, he begins from this notion that these are women I condescend to mm -hmm. and that I, mm -hmm. I use all mm -hmm. the decorum mm -hmm. of, of, a, of, a, of a male patriarchal mm -hmm. society mm -hmm. on them to the fact that at the end he's making political accusations about yes. them. He's yes. now views them mm -hmm. and he has to accuse them of mm -hmm. being something mm -hmm. uh, uh, political. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. it, the first thing he says when he walks in is, we have national problems to solve. Right. Uh, you know, in, in other words, keeping them again on the margin. Mm -hmm. And yet what they're trying to do is foreground this problem of women uh, who, who breach the gap between the personal and the public mm -hmm. right. again and again. Mm -hmm. And I think also one of the great scenes in the film is that they're on a hunger strike mm -hmm. and yet they're nursing their children. Mm -hmm. And they are the symbols of nurturance. They go to the pulperia, to the grocery store, and there's no food. And they say, mm -hmm. how do we feed our families? How do we feed our children? Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, they point up again and again the ironies. And, mm -hmm. and as you say, he's a patriarchal voice in the film. They mm -hmm. are, of course, the resisting voice to right. this. And they're very monolithic. much representative of the community uh, kind of resolution of this yes, problem, the collective. fact that it's not just individuals right. that are struggling. Right. Uh, we d really get to know very few of them individually or as individual characters, that it's really a community problem mm -hmm. and the co in order to resolve it or they have to work together and pull together as a community. You know, that's, uh, that's very interesting because it does bring up a question mm -hmm. of the organization of a, of a production. Mm -hmm. Because anybody who's ever been involved with the film production knows that mm -hmm. they're highly, I mean, they must be because they cost a lot of money, mm -hmm. even low budget, they're, they're mm -hmm. highly mm -hmm. organized. But that tends to mean that there's a strict hierarchy mm -hmm. of, 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 of command that perhaps mm -hmm. the Marine Corps would envy, mm -hmm. in, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in certain instances. But mm -hmm. that's not how this film was made, as I understand it. No, it was very much uh, the, the writers would uh, interview all of the people that uh, had been involved or had been witnesses to the original massacre. I mean, this was a very specific historical moment that they're talking about. And even though we can extrapolate and say it also represents the many other massacres that have occurred uh, against the miners mm -hmm. uh, uh, and against other Bolivians, it's a very, it was a very specific event that had a lot of political mm -hmm. repercussions at the time in, in 1967. Um, but they interviewed a lot of the people that had been involved and had witnessed uh, these very atrocious acts and then incorporated these into, into making a storyline that would be as accessible to people as possible. Because I think that's another important thing to bring up about the film is that even though we can sit here and enjoy it, it was made for a very specific political purpose and that yes. was to alert the uh, Bolivian people mm -hmm. to give them back a piece of their history that they many of them may not have known what had gone on because so much of Bolivian history has been repressed and has been censored out of official histories. And that's one of Sanjines' main political projects is to kind of reclaim history for the people. So th this is a cinema that can become a kind of collective memory. It's not only mm -hmm. a collective project in terms of, uh, uh, of production, mm -hmm. but, but is a repository mm -hmm. for a collective memory of things. Right. I'd like to step in there if I could also and just, and, just <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. and just mention that uh, this is uh, common probably to a lot of different cinemas of Latin America and mm -hmm. certainly cinemas that, uh, that are able to produce films in liberalized conditions as this film was made I believe in a 10 month period of liberalization in Bolivia. Right. The same thing has happened in Argentina in post Junta Argentina. Yes. Mm -hmm. People have used memory as a way of write, rewriting Mm -hmm. uh, not the official history, but of course, writing their own unofficial history. Right. Right. Uh, and also in post-Franco Spain, the same mm -hmm. thing has occurred. Of course, they had 40 years of silence to recuperate mm -hmm. with many voices. I also think the interesting thing about, another interesting thing about this film is that it uses, the, the use of this collective voice is also a response to the monolithic 
uh, one-sided unilateral version of the official history and mm -hmm. I really yeah, like that, that yes. idea of the more pluralistic right. uh, rewriting of history. Right, here we get the women, we get the mm -hmm. university student, mm -hmm. we get the minors. There's right. an attempt to really cover <laughs> a lot of different views exactly. and perspectives of the situation. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, there's an interesting thing about this, this notion of, of, of memory to me. Mm -hmm. uh, that certainly there's a lot of novels that are memory narratives, and they're very mm -hmm. great ones, some of them Latin, Am <laughs> Latin American mm -hmm. uh, novels. But there's a particular appropriateness about mm -hmm. uh, memory in oral cultures. Mm -hmm. That is, that we have people here speaking mm -hmm. their stories and passing the stories on mm -hmm. through, I mean, the direct reproductive processes mm -hmm. of the cinema. So it, it duplicates. Right. Um, the possibilities of mm -hmm. a collective memory mm -hmm. in a dominantly oral culture, one that does not depend. Because right. we have no notion that these people mm -hmm. depend primarily upon the right. written word as a means of communication, which would be censored in any case. All right. Now, that's very interesting because one of his next projects, Fuera de Aquí, which was done in Ecuador, specifically uses a storyteller in the community to kind of recount the, the story, which also dealt with the sterilization of Indian population, as he had dealt with in, in Blood of the Condor. Yeah, I'd like to also say that um, this use of the episodic structure in the film, uh, and partly, I think, has to do with its epic character, is not uh, a, a narrative in our uh, traditional idea right. of what a narrative is. There's mm -hmm. no suspense per se, mm -hmm. but perhaps this does respond more to the cyclical mode of storytelling of these mm -hmm. primitive people, uh, well not primitive, but primitive cultures in a sense, right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, pre-industrial cultures mm -hmm. in Latin America, in particular Bolivia, where the people still live uh, as they've lived for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. well, the other thing that, inter that interests me about this notion mm -hmm. of, of, of collective memory, since I'm <laughs> agree with you, <laughs> uh, is the, the way in which memory is something stored inside of, uh, inside of us. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, the only way you get rid of the memories of people is to kill them. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Because, exactly. I mean, you can burn books, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. do other things, mm -hmm. but then if people tell their stories, mm -hmm. and everybody, and that's one of the things I like about the episodic structure of this mm -hmm. film, is mm -hmm. that while they're all united in the experience of their class mm -hmm. of, 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 their, mm -hmm. uh, of, of their situation, yet there are all the stories that dwell within, mm -hmm. uh, within right. the people themselves. And that they've recreated in this film, of, uh, since right. so much of the film was done on the basis of improvisation, I presume yeah. that part, they've put a lot into the right. telling of the story. Right, that's something that maybe should be brought out, is that many of these people are recreating their, their own experiences. And as we were talking mm -hmm. about before, it became this very emotional experience for mm -hmm. them while they were making the film to have to go through this again, the, that torture sequence, which is uh, <laughs> extremely brutal. Mm -hmm. the, the, mm -hmm. uh, the character, the, the man playing it, had actually been tortured in, in the same way, and they felt a little bit reluctant asking him to, mm -hmm. to go through this again. But he insisted that he wanted to be hung up in the same way to really recreate the, the authenticity mm -hmm. uh, so that people could really see what this experience uh, had been like. And it's, it, it's, uh, there are so many stories that go along with the production of this film, but one is in the opening sequence where we have the, this, the Katavi uh, massacre. Right. Um, apparently some of the crew was so upset by it because people were reliving this in such an emotional way that many forgot to load their cameras uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're, we're completely completely taken up with events. Luckily, they had a number of cameras and so they were able to capture the whole thing. But it became uh, this way of kind of exercising, uh, you know, by living through it again. But, but see, that's, that's interesting because there's a great deal of revolutionary cinema from Latin America, mm -hmm. but also from other places that wants to, through documentary means, recreate events. But I, I would say there's, there's a general tendency that this film goes against, and mm -hmm. that is to include the so-called distancing devices. Right. I mean, making sure that that you get involved and then you you hold back and you mm -hmm. analyze it mm -hmm. in traditionally in a dialectical manner, understanding right. mm -hmm. historical forces. This film doesn't work that way. No, because it's completely opposed to what Sanjines is trying to do and the audience that he's trying to reach. Because he'd had actually a bad experience with Blood of the Condor. Uh, in his first version of that film, it had used a much more convoluted narrative structure of using flashbacks and flash forwards. And when he originally showed it to the people, uh, they didn't understand it. And he felt this was a real problem. 
this was a film made for them, and if they didn't understand it, uh, then he was really deficient as a filmmaker, or the collective was. Right. So he really took pains with this film to make the story, the, the narrative, as accessible as possible and not distance people, uh, but to, to use every effort to kind of draw them into the story so that they could follow it. I'd like to make a comment on that. Um, I kept wondering when I was watching the film why I wasn't really more emotionally involved in the film. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's a, certainly an extremely horrifying mm -hmm. series of events, the mm -hmm. first 10 or 15 minutes of the oh, film. Yeah. Yeah. This, this qual um, quantitative approach that the, they use at the beginning of the film. Mm -hmm. First there was this massacre, then the next, and mm -hmm. 1,000 dead, then 400 yes. dead, then mm -hmm. 80 dead, then so many dead, and the responsible ones mm -hmm. are. And mm -hmm and putting together this amazing pastiche of, mm -hmm. uh, of events that are, are shocking for, for anyone. Mm -hmm. um, I, again, I kept wondering, well, why am I not sort of more involved in this? What's mm -hmm. happening? Mm -hmm. And I would ask myself that throughout the film. Mm -hmm. And I realized that uh, even though there are no distancing devices in the film, that in some ways what's happening is that the, all of the cathartic events are happening to the people who are making the film uh -huh. and okay. not to those who are those of us mm -hmm. who are watching the film. Mm -hmm. If we have catharsis then it's through their experience of the film and mm -hmm. they say from one of the initial scenes the one of the narrators says mm -hmm. these people are not actors and or we are not actors we will be recreating the mm -hmm. events that occurred the night before uh, the day, the night before, mm -hmm. the night of San Juan. <laughs> right, the night of San Juan. But that also brings up a point that this is, uh, you know, it's a, a, a film that addresses an, a specific audience, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is made for a specific audience, for a specific political purpose, defines right. itself as populist. Mm -hmm. Yet we're used to uh, another notion of populist cinema. I mm -hmm. mean, a, a great populist American mm -hmm. filmmaker, mm -hmm. always cited, is, is, a, is a Frank Capra. Right. Yet the emotional relationship we have to this film mm -hmm. versus a Capra film mm -hmm. strikes me as, 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 as quite different. Yeah. It, uh, far away. And it, it makes me think a little bit of the John Sayles film, Mate One, actually, in mm -hmm. which uh, I felt that there, neither did I have that tremendous, those tremendous feelings of sympathy. Mm -hmm. There was, it was more an empathy with what was happening, mm -hmm. and less of an emotional involvement. Mm -hmm. No, I think that I, I think that's right, and perhaps that comes from not selecting a Mr. Deeds or a Mr. Smith or mm. yes. a, 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 a James Good. Stewart. It's not only. What I'm thinking about is not only not having the star mm -hmm. aura, mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, about it, mm -hmm. but having this strong attachment to a central protagonist mm -hmm. who carries the mm -hmm. burden of, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. of, of, of the drama. If I could add a little academic footnote to that, there's a very famous uh, play written by Lope de Vega in Spain during the golden age of Spanish theater in the 17th century in which, called Fuente Ovejuna, in which the commendador is killed mm -hmm. and the entire, when they're tortured by the government forces, all the people say, our village did it. Mm -hmm. And there is no central protagonist. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also one of the most popular plays in the Soviet Union today and is produced year after year. Oh, well, the, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. The, you, 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 you bring, that's a very interesting point because, of course, many of the Soviet films of the 1920s, mm -hmm. Eisenstein's films, but those right. other filmmakers mm -hmm. do not have a central protagonist. Mm -hmm. They have a collective right. protag mm -hmm. uh, uh, protagonist, and it's one of the shifts for the worse, I think everybody agrees historically, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is when that that particular mm -hmm. moment passed in the Soviet cinema, mm -hmm. and then the imposition of a false populist kind mm -hmm. of, of, right. of, of cinema that has the mm -hmm. uh, a close identification with the protagonist and mm -hmm. becomes so-called socialist realism. Mm -hmm. To me, it's interesting that uh, San Hines would not take that model. I mean, mm -hmm. that he's he's clearly a filmmaker coming from a nationalist left. Right. But but also he, he knows the the movements in the history of the international right. left as well, and right. so there's a whole tradition of filmmaking mm -hmm. available in many countries enforced mm -hmm. uh, that he that he explicitly rejects. Right, and even what was going on in Latin America at the time, because as I said, he's tailored his films to his audience. You mentioned this list of the, the, the names of the massacres mm -hmm. at the very beginning and also naming the responsible people because he felt it was really time to move past any kind of metaphoric use okay. of, of protest, of, of massacre, that what the people wanted was to have those 
people indicted, right? That the, the name specifically the ones that were responsible instead of just this kind of amorphous oppressor, that there were specific names, specific generals, uh, the owner of the mining company, that these people should be held accountable for their actions if through the film alone, because certainly uh, in real terms they never were held account accountable. Well, well, that's very interesting that the film is the only thing that alas, historically holds them uh, accountable, but it becomes, it becomes the document of record on right. this while the, I, I take it, well, well n they're neither tried nor jailed, nor perhaps the official history names them as such. Right, although Barrientos, uh, who's really indicted within the film, was killed rather mysteriously um, uh, all, right <laughs> after, uh, well, not a couple of years af after the event. Um, but it's true they never were, were tried as such. Th this uh, brings up, uh, just to perhaps expand on a point mm -hmm. you made, that this film absolutely rejects another mode. Well, we, there's one mode we've mm -hmm. sort of talked about, and that's the mode that, that includes distancing devices, mm -hmm. that, that puts the audience at a particular kind of analytic distance. This mm -hmm. film brings us in, mm -hmm. though in ways, that, uh, special ways that Barbara was just yeah. describing. But there's the other tradition, and that's this allegorical tradition. Right, right, like uh, Latine and the Promised Land that you were, were mentioning. Right, which is uh, the Promised Land, which is another part of this uh, series where it draws on national symbols, something like the Promised, promised mm -hmm. Land, but it's mm -hmm. not, you know, there, there's a level of generality. Mm -hmm. It may be true and it may mm -hmm. be historical, mm -hmm. but there's a way in which naming the names, mm -hmm. um, right. showing the picture right. of the general is, uh, is avoided. Right, right. But in using allegory, you have to rely upon an audience that is familiar with making those kinds of right. connections. And for uh, uh, San Ginés, he was interested in intellectuals and the middle class and people living in the city seeing his films and knowing that these marginal peoples existed and their problems. But his real audience were, were, were the people themselves. And if he felt that those devices would somehow alienate people or confuse them, he, he wasn't interested in in using them. That, that says something very interesting about uh, implied, implied audience because mm -hmm. um, since so many of these really wonderful mm -hmm. and so, so gifted Latin American filmmakers are products of the middle class themselves, right. university educated, mm -hmm. frequently with part of their education internationally, mm -hmm. etc., there are certain societies in which they think their primary audience is going to be a middle class and professional class right. who are movie going. Mm -hmm. And that's not San Hines is no. a concept at all. No, no, because he'd, as I said, he'd had a very bad experience when he first went in with Blood of the Condor, that he was rejected by this, this community, uh, that he wanted to make a very, you know, moving film about their plight, uh, their problems with the Progress Corps, uh, this thinly veiled uh, Peace Corps that appears in the, in the film. But um, he, he uh, knew that uh, in order to reach them, he really had to, to speak in, in their own language, that it wasn't just for the people back in the city. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 that's, that takes us back, I think, to women mm -hmm. um, and the kinds of women we see. And we talked about this mm -hmm. a little bit mm -hmm. earlier. How do, you, how do you locate this film within traditions of Latin American filmmaking and their representation well, of women? It seems that more and more in, in Latin American cinema that women are becoming an important, I hesitate to use the word metaphor for the Latin American experience mm -hmm. because it always, it tends to deny the very materiality of women's right. experience. And I would again use a more academic word, which is a, a metonymy. That is, they're almost functioning symbolically rather than metaphorically. Mm -hmm. But I think we can see this in, in Bemberg's films, for example, where mm -hmm. Camila defies the forces of repression in the official story where mm -hmm. a woman learns the truth about her adopted child's origins and therefore unravels the, the entire uh, political uh, uh, chaos that exists underneath this uh, smooth discourse of the official story of Argentinian history. Mm -hmm. It's happening also in Spain and I think in a lot of, uh, in Cuba there are Cuba, famous examples. Sure. Lucia, Lucia, of course, is one of the most famous examples. One way or another. Yeah. One way, Sarah Gomez is uh, one way or another, sure. etc. Okay, but the, you know, the, the interesting thing to me in, in watching this, is very much as the, as, as the outsider, mm -hmm. is that uh, th 
the variety of experiences mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of Latin American mm -hmm, women mm -hmm, crossing mm -hmm. from one nationality Certainly. to mm -hmm. another, but also I mean, from one culture and organization mm -hmm. of culture, but from one class to another mm -hmm. strongly. Well, we all know that's part of women's experience, that, that a woman's experience cuts across all race, class. Right. Uh, we didn't even bring up Brazilian cinema, and we right. could talk yeah. of Chica and, and a lot of right. Iracema and a lot of other films that have to do with women as well. Right. Uh, the women's experience cuts across all of those, those uh, barriers in those lines. But specifically, I'm, I'm thinking about how the camera treats, uh, for example, the women in this film. Do you find... Ah, well, I think it or treats how the every... Camera the camera works. Okay. I, I, how it, the camera works in the film. It, it certainly treats everyone from uh, just about their eye level. The camera mm -hmm. is almost consistently at human, human mm -hmm. level. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the first scene you notice that in is in, fa in fact the scene when the women go to the grocery store and mm -hmm. there's no food and the camera circles around them as if it were one of the women trying to press in and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. So the camera, if it privileges us as spectators, it privileges us as witnesses to all of these okay, events. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. It cleaves through the crowd in the introductory sequence, mm -hmm. sequence at the massacre of Katavi and again at the end mm -hmm. when the massacre doesn't occur, when we have the happy ending mm -hmm. at the end of the film and in several other scenes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's I, one of the things I find about the film, Susan, is that while it is narratively very accessible, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, he's achieved that, mm -hmm. there is, within that pop populist narrative, mm -hmm. within that accessibility, there's uh, an intricacy mm -hmm. as, uh, a as well, because it's not uh, a, f a film where the camera shows up and is just a uh, an observer of the scene from only one position. I mean, right. uh, it, to use the, the language that production people use, he has a lot of coverage mm -hmm. of all of the uh, of the the, the, the events. Right. Uh, that's quite interesting to uh, to me. Right. Well, uh, we were talking about rejecting these other modes of filmmaking. I think that he's very much aware of a dialectical process. I mean, he was a very uh, he is very mm -hmm. clearly a Marxist. He's interested in showing the interaction of these various levels. It's not. I mean, the majority of the focus of the film is on the Indians, but right. we do get these other aspects of the the university student, uh, for example, and uh, you know other kinds of factors that that are entering into this this one one massacre yeah yeah, that's that's uh, re really quite uh, really quite interesting. I just want you to know, make sure, one other comment of, um, about the women uh, in the film is that I think for many people it's a surprise that the women have such a vocal role because normally when we think of Latin American culture we think of it as a very uh, kind of in terms of machismo which is something that comes up in film after film from Latin America and most people don't realize that within Indian culture women have traditionally had a very strong role and a very much uh, are on equal footing with the, with the men. And indeed, a number of them are, are matrilineal uh, cultures mm -hmm. the, the themselves. Yes. Well, you know, on that last word mm -hmm. having to do with uh, matriarchy, we have to bring this 30 minutes uh, to a close. If you'd like more information about uh, Cinema Then, Cinema Now, or about Cinema Studies, graduate or undergraduate, drop us a line. Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, the College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Let me give you that information again, okay? Drop it to Cinema Then, Cinema Now, The College of Staten Island, Staten Island, New York, 10301. Well, Barbara, I'm happy to have had you here to bring your Thank expertise you. about a number of features of Latin American cinema as well as the representation of women. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Susan, uh, your particular expertise on Sanhinas <laughs> is invaluable to a show, uh, to show like this. I want to thank you for being well, here. Well, thank you. Okay. As always, I hope that our, our thought and discussion here leads you to thought and discussion at home that you enjoy. Thanks for joining us. <laughs>